thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you everybody for that warm, what, response and welcome and so forth. Oh, it looks like you're going to be a tough crowd today, huh? <laughs> well, if that's the case, uh, I hadn't planned to do this, but now I just made a, de uh, a decision. I decided no more secrets about civil rights in this country. That's right. Let's break it down. Let's tell the truth. All right. I mean, no more playing around and playing games, huh? As a matter of fact, in terms of those secrets, secret number one, we need to know that in the United States, we have a lot of dirty linen as far as civil rights are concerned. Lots of people in this country have not only lost their constitutional rights, but they've lost their dignity. They've lost any and everything that you could think of that would be uh, important, including their culture, their souls, don't even mention lives at the, at the bounty here. And we're talking about dirty, dirty linen. When we start talking about civil rights, what's the first thing that comes to our mind? What's meant by civil rights? And obviously what you're thinking right now is uh, let's say those rights that you are entitled to the country of your citizenship those citizenship rights, rights within the country. Just as you would say civil war is a war within the country, civil rights, rights within the country. So we're going to get all up in that, see what's been going on and see why so many people lost right, have lost rights in this country at one time or another. Talk about the impact of it briefly and see if we can't go from there. At the same time, Let's say now, talking about, uh, let's say, scores and scores of people have been injured one way or another as a result of denial of those rights. But I guess, I guess I can be the bearer of some good news today uh, and point out that, hey, uh, throughout, let's say, decades and decades of history in this country, the United States has made many strides and are definitely, I feel, on the right road moving toward the destination of trying to resolve any and all problems in that area. And I think that's a good thing. However, we are not at that destination yet, but I do feel we are on the right road to get there. And uh, so that's a good thing. But let's get started and see if we can really sort of break things down a little bit. Uh, and of course, I'm going to emphasize, let's say, uh, the modern civil rights movement. And when you think about the modern civil rights movement that got started, let's say in the uh, 40s and the 50s, specifically, we're going to talk about blacks and black rights. Uh, let's call them civil rights or lack thereof in this country. And we're going to see if we can't break it down. Uh, when you begin talking about, let's say, uh, civil rights for blacks in this country, uh, let's say we don't want to go back to uh, the 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment because that was the time period when that was some relief. But we need to go back before that time to see why there was a need for a 13th Amendment and a 14th Amendment. Uh, let's just say anyone familiar with the 13th Amendment, and I, and I would imagine some of you have seen the documentary, if you will, the 13th, right? Uh, so 13th Amendment, what's that all about? All right, a volunteer, the 13th Amendment. All right, so you said you need some help, huh? 13th Amendment <laughs> and passed in 1865 ended slavery in this country. It stated slavery in the United States is unconstitutional. 
So you say, okay, well, did we need such a law? Did we need such a bill? And of course, of course, what you're going to find is by that time, black people in this country had been enslaved for approximately 205 years. Black people in this country had been enslaved for approximately 205 years from roughly 1660 to 1865. So think about the impact of that on civil rights. But then again, the conclusion is going to be that blacks were given no civil rights in this country. No rights whatsoever during 205 years. How many generations is that? Let's say if we say that a generation is 25 to 35 years, we use 30 years. If, you, if we use 30 years, that's seven generations. Seven generations of enslavement, generation after generation after generation after generation, you get the idea. And we're going to pass that on from that generation to the next, to the next, to the next. During that particular generation, there were different kinds of laws that governed the conduct and behavior of blacks during slavery. You know them as slave codes. You know the ones that said it's against the law to pay a black person for his or her labor. Or laws that said it's against the law for a black person to own property. And uh, you probably have done some research, and if you have, you found that there were some laws that stated, especially in states like uh, Alabama, Mississippi, it's against the law for a black person to own even a dog. Even a dog. If any black person is found to be guilty of such an offense, first of all, the dog is to be killed immediately for its role in all of this. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Going one step further, not only are we talking about that, but the black person is to be given up to 39 lashes on his bare back, well laid on, in addition to be fined, dare I say, up to $10? Hmm, if you're working every day, not getting paid for your labor, you might not be able to pay $10 for a fine. So in that case, perhaps more, uh, let's say, uh, stripes, more lashes might be in the often. But at any rate, we had those kinds of laws. It's against the law to teach a black person to read and write. Uh, it's against the law for a black person to carry a stick or a, or a cane unless he's blind or crippled. Mississippi even had laws stating that it's against the law for a black person to make joyful noises in the streets. But at any rate, so law after law after law during that 205 year period. But as we move along and talk about uh, impact and then talk about the needs for a civil rights movement, think about it this way. After 205 years of enslavement, Blacks came out of slavery with zero. Zero property, zero money in the bank, zero education, virtually, and zero rights, you name it, whatsoever. And at the same time, you're going to find in 1865, the Ku Klux Klan was started. Why was it started? To ensure that black people remain in their place. So times were hard for blacks. So in one word, you might say after 205 years of enslavement, blacks came out of enslavement with nothing. And at the same time, after 205 years of enslaving black people, whites came out of that, pe that same period with everything. And just between the two of us, that has been part of the dilemma of civil rights and equality in this country that has existed from that time all the way up to today. And when you begin talking about a civil rights movement, the idea here was 
for black people to get the rights that were being denied. So after, it, after enslavement, new laws were passed. You know them as maybe black codes. In other words, laws stated in free society that it's against the law for a black person to hold a job over a white person. You say, hmm, oh, okay, or better yet, if any Negro does not perform his work responsibilities to the satisfaction of his white employer, he can be beaten on the job. Okay, wait a wait, I'm confused. Did I say this is slavery? Oh, this is after the slavery period. This is during the period of freedom and equality, right? For all, as a matter of fact, huh? So we wanna make sure we understand what we're talking about here. But at any rate, so when you think about that, that is going to go on for a generation. As a matter of fact, uh, it's going to be extended from that generation all the way up to maybe, uh, what year is it? 2017, but we'll break that down in a few. Coming back to the case, and it sounds like uh, uh, we should, uh, it should be nice and fresh in here, right? So the air should be good, so that's a good thing. So when you think about it, uh, during the first generation of freedom, uh, blacks were not so free. And you're going to find that not only were black codes passed, but Jim Crow laws as well, segregation laws, right? In other words, uh, there was an obsession with ensuring that blacks remained in their place. And as far as white society was concerned, the place for blacks was one subordinate to whites. Uh, Jim Crow laws, everybody knows, segregation laws. It's against the law for a black person to live in the same community with a white person. It's against the law for a black person to attend the same school with a white person. It's against the law, let's say, for a black person to drink from the same water fountain as a white person. You know that's a problem, right? And of course, it's against the law for a black person to marry a white person. Hmm. And don't forget, it's against the law to store textbooks for black students in the same warehouse as textbooks for white students. All kinds of laws that were designed not only to segregate, segregate black people, but also to denigrate and subjugate blacks as well. At the same time, you're going to find there were other laws passed in that first generation that stated, let's say, you cannot vote unless your grandfather voted in the last presidential election before the Civil War, which would have been in 1860. Blacks, since blacks were enslaved at that time, then that would automatically disqualify blacks from what? Being able to vote. And on top of that, during that same generation, the United States Supreme Court came out and said, hey, it's okay to, to separate people. In other words, separate but equal comes out in 1896 during that first generation of black freedom. And at the same time, so hey, I guess black society was doomed. But what you're going to find when you check it out, that hey, as a result of many courageous blacks during that first generation of black freedom, and also the, the, the courage of some whites as well, a movement gradually got started. So we know that blacks didn't end black slavery themselves that whites were there for that. At the same time, uh, the first civil rights bill that blacks got, blacks didn't write them, whites did that. And at the top of the list would be Senator Charles Sumner, or over in the House, uh, Representative Thaddeus Stevens, who was indicating that, hey, blacks should get at least uh, 40 acres and a military mule, right? so that they can be independent. That was voted down, but the Civil Rights Bill would be passed even though it would be vetoed by Governor Andrew, I mean, <laughs> President Andrew Johnson. 
but Congress would override it. But moving on, so during the next, so during that generation, courageous blacks such as a W.E.B. Du Bois, Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, William Monroe Trotter, Sojourner Truth, Ida B. Wells, Harriet Tubman, you name it, you name it, you name it. There were any number of blacks who got to stirring and stirring it up until a movement would quietly begin coming together. Second generation, 1900 to 1935, you name it. Hey, what, what did we have? Not only black individuals, but black organizations as well. The Niagara Movement, uh, the NACP, uh, let's say uh, the National Urban League. Wow, two million blacks or so left the South going to the North. From there, think about the UNIA with Marcus Garvey, or think about the Nation of Islam, or go beyond that to coming into the next generation core, SCLC, SNCC, the, the Black Panthers, now the Neighborhood Organized Workers, any number of organizations got, got involved. And what you're going to find, bam, that's where I come in. That's where I joined the movement uh, and had personal involvement during the 60s. Uh, I was a student at that particular time, but uh, as I was growing up in Mobile, Alabama, the civil rights movement was exploding all around me. So I was growing up and I listened, plus, and uh, I had attended segregated schools when I was coming through. So black teachers every day talk to us about how you have to work hard, you have to be smart, you have to be dedicated, you have to, one of the secrets that they would, would tell us, you have to work twice as hard as whites. Don't let that get out of here now, okay? But as a result, hey, we worked harder. I, I believe that we worked harder. Uh, when I return to Mobile today and uh, check up on some of my old buddies from the, uh, from the past, many of them went on to law school, med school, and other professional types of positions. So I think uh, uh, there's a good chance that we work pretty hard. But uh, when it comes down to personal involvement, uh, let me ask, can you think of any uh, let's say civil rights demonstration that you've heard of and let's see if I was involved in it some kind of way. Anyone that you can think of, a, a march, a demonstration, you name it, just one. All right, put your thinking caps on. All right, yes. All right, she said the march on Washington. Now, out of all the marches that I was not in, she, she asked me about it. <laughs> I don't believe it. Now, I could talk about some of the things I did on the periphery of, in terms of helping other people to get there, but no. But you're all familiar with that one, right? We're talking the March on Washington. What year was it? 63, 1963. And the whole idea was that, hey, a group of black leaders had gotten together and decided let's apply pressure on the federal government to do something about black civil rights. Let's apply some pressure. Uh, at the forefront of that movement was A. Philip Randolph. Not only was he threatening President uh, Kennedy with a march on Washington with 100,000 black people, he would say, about 100,000 black people. But he, would, he had been doing that for the longest. He had been around long enough to have threatened uh, President uh, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He, pre he, he uh, threatened, let's say, a march of 50,000 blacks at that time. And this was in what, uh, should we say, uh, uh, the late uh, the late 30s, he pressured um, President Roosevelt so much that President Ro Roosevelt signed an executive order. I believe it was 8802, which ended 
discrimination in terms of, let's say, uh, military jobs, uh, uh, contracts with military agencies, government agencies, etc. So he did that after he left at going on what his four administrations. But think about it, he was replaced by uh, President Truman. Was A. Philip Randolph there? Yep, he pressured him. He pressured him until he signed executive order, I believe it was 9981. And what did it do? It ended segregation in the United States Armed Forces. That was a biggie, that was a biggie. But uh, so, I don't want to go any further than that. I will make one, one suggestion. If you're really interested in getting the feel for the March on Washington, there are any number of references I could give you, but there's a movie called Get on the Bus. Get on the Bus. Has anyone seen it? All right. Was it touching in, your, in, in some sense to you? It was. It moved you. Get on the bus. Check it out. So we're talking, I didn't go to Washington at that time. I was doing other things. But at the same time, there's a group of blacks who are going to leave LA. They're going to get on the bus and of course take that bus to DC and you're going to find out a lot about black lives and whether black lives matter uh, uh, during that particular bus ride from LA uh, to there. Let's try one more time. Any demonstration that you can think of, any conflict that you can think of. Yes sir, and I know we're on the same path. I can see it. Pardon me? Selma. Oh, Selma, Selma. As in uh, the march from Selma to Montgomery. <coughs> Bam, of course I was, <laughs> etc. cetera. Uh, I was a student at the time. Uh, I was a student at Alabama State University and um, and it's in the capital, which is Montgomery, Alabama. So I was on campus and one day, uh, let's say uh, SNCC representatives as well as now neighborhood, or neighborhood organized workers came on campus and they brought little kids with them. They brought little kids with them, maybe uh, four, five, six years old who had been beaten up in Selma you know, with the initial attempts to march across the Pettus Bridge, right? And they, the little kids would get up and then they came, uh, my mama was beating up, they hit my mama and then cause she wanted her, her rights, uh, you know, and, and college students, you know, and Alabama State was segregated at the time, right? So in other words, <laughs> you know, we're listening. <laughs> okay, if you're concerned, uh, uh, let's say the marchers will be, should be coming through tomorrow, da 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 da, on their way to what? The capital in Montgomery. So we want you to be with us. Are you with us? Yeah! Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the next day, so I was all ready to uh, uh, make that trip. I dressed all up and everything. You know, not like this because I was a student, but I didn't realize that we might be going into battle. You know, I thought that, hey, are we going to be able to march down uh, for our constitutional rights, right? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, uh, so when the marchers came through, they actually marched past our campus. So, and that was to, of course, get uh, maybe another couple of thousand uh, black students to what? Participate. And so when I was in the line, I was uh, around the end of the line. And what was interesting as we marched through the city, Montgomery, there were many whites on the sidewalks, on the uh, curbs, let's say, uh, throwing bottles, uh, spitting, those kinds of things, right? And uh, I guess probably since we are, were a group of college students, I, uh, you know, I was a little nervous myself. You know, I hadn't anticipated conflict, and, you know, because I try to be nonviolent as much as possible. So I'm, I'm with a group of guys, and as we walked by, and there were about 
maybe seven or eight white guys on the sidewalk here who, you know, started with the nigger, uh, you know, ribs and on and on and on, while watermelon heads and blah, 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 and whatever, whatever. And of course, so some of the guys who I was with uh, cursed them out and indicated, hey, blank the blank blank, uh, this ain't the nonviolent end of the movement. So bring your and blah, 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 blah. And I, and I went like this, you know. But I also kept my eyes open on any space where I, if I needed to, you know, depart. So that I could, you know, so that I could get a new movement going. But at any rate, so there was no, so that was anticlimactic for me. But that was one march that I was in, in uh, at Alabama State. <clears throat> because we used to march <clears throat> on the Capitol all the time. And on one time, once again, uh, blacks in different parts of the South had been in involved in demonstrations and were beaten. Once again, they came through our campus because, uh, uh, and I guess at that time, Governor Wallace was pretty much on his way out the door. And but uh, so he was a major target of the civil rights movement for the South. <clears throat> uh, Governor uh, uh, Governor Wallace in Alabama, and right next door, uh, let's say uh, in uh, uh, Georgia, Lester Maddox, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we marched, and on one occasion, I um, once again representatives from SNCC came through our campus. SNCC was very active in Alabama and Mississippi. SNCC representatives came through, they were looking, they were pretty much dressed the way you are dressed right now, men and women. They came singing freedom songs on the campus, so black students obviously started gathering around two, three, four, five, six hundred, seven hundred students, etc. And the idea was that, hey, we need to uh, march on Governor Wallace. We need to do it. And I'm, yeah, et cetera, right? That's the, that was the feeling. So the next day, said, be in a stadium at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. So, you know, 10 o'clock next morning, I'm there. You know, I'm dressed the way you were dressed and everything. Probably had my favorite shirt and pants on, something like that. I didn't know we were going into battle that day. All right, so I'm there sitting around, and then helicopters above. I'm saying, hmm, that's interesting. Okay, well, they're probably looking for something. And at the same time, the stadium was filling up, maybe about 3,000 uh, black students, something like that. And uh, then the SNCC representatives marched in. But they, uh, this must have been the military auxiliary of the group that came in the day before. They had helmets on, brogams on, uh, fatigues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, beards down to here, et cetera. And I'm saying, hmm, boy, they look like they're going to war. So they came in, gave their big speech, let's go, let's go. We need to what, make, to carry the message of rights for black people on and on and on. So we got out there and we started, Mark, they said, line up two by two. So can you imagine if we are lining up two by two, how long that line was for maybe about 3,000 students or so? That's right, so we're talking at least a couple of blocks, right? But initially, maybe that were about, maybe about uh, 1,500 initially, but they felt that wasn't enough. So they said, instead of marching down this sidewalk from campus downtown, let's march through different buildings on campus and sing and raise hell until professors excuse class and then we would have more students. So we marched through building to building, et cetera, singing loud, raising hell, and uh, uh, by the time we came out of the buildings, we had at least 3,000 students, right? So we got one block from campus, and I was probably, since I was probably close to the middle of the line for, uh, let's say, 3,000 students. 
3,000 students in groups of twos, right? So I'm back here, we get one block off campus, a police car comes from that direction, one from that direction, two policemen here, two policemen there, they jump out with their batons, et cetera, and the uh, SNCC representatives say, we're going through, we're going through. So, and I'm back here, I didn't have to worry. I said, yeah, we're going through, we're going through. So the front of the line started and the cops jumped back in their cars and left. And we cheered because we had a victory. Lots of winning. And, but we didn't get tired of winning then. And that's another question at right now, but that's another story. But at any rate, so we get two blocks from campus and about six to eight uh, police cars come from that direction, from that direction, etc. And with about four to six policemen in each car, they jump out and block the street. And whoa, now this is a, now this, I hadn't bargained for this. And the SNCC representative said, okay, all we want to do is exercise our constitutional rights. Let's get off the sidewalk like we had been doing, two by two by two, said, and what we're going to do is get out, get out into the middle of the street and we're all going to come on up front. We're all going to push up front, et cetera. And I'm saying, wow, as a matter of fact, oops, 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 oops. Here I am on the front row. I'm saying, what the is this? I didn't, I didn't ask for this and the cops were standing right here. I'm there and then the SNCC representative said, sit down, sit down, everybody sit down. So I said, okay, I sat down, I'm looking up, and the cops in front of me were like this with their baton. <laughs> and I said, oh, blank. I said, what am I doing here? I shouldn't be here, et cetera. So, we, so I'm sweating and all sad and low and everything and the SNCC representative said, we are exercising our constitutional rights. There's nothing they can do to us to kill our spirit and our rights. And I'm thinking, kill? Then the SNCC representative said, everybody, take your glasses off and any jewelry. I said, what? For what? <laughs> For what? I said, no, I don't want to. I said, I said, blank. I said, I'm up, et cetera. We were given five minutes to disperse, or they were going to disperse us. Truck pulls up with about um, 15 horses on it, and uh, more policemen and possum in get the horses off, so they are lying across the street. They're going to run over us. So we're sitting there. And then five minutes, four, three, two, one minute, 60 seconds to disperse. And at that particular time, you know what happened. A television truck comes around the corner with reporters on top of the truck with their cameras rolling, et cetera, and you know, getting the action and everything. And the SNCC representative started passing the words, don't worry, they aren't going to do anything with the cameras here, et cetera, et cetera. And I was praying, you know, I wasn't big on praying in those days, but I was praying they were right. And they didn't do anything. So that was, let me see, 10, 11, about 11.30. Around 12 o'clock, I sort of looked behind me, and instead of 3,000 students, there were about 300. So I said, wow. Well, I said, it's lunchtime, they probably got hungry, and they'll be back. 30 minutes later, I looked behind me, and there were maybe about, uh, let's say, maybe uh, 150 students. So I said, hmm. I said, at the rate things are going, we get small enough, anything can happen. But I was hungry, so I, I was hungry, so I decided to go, and the plan was to go get a bite to eat and rush back up there, right? And of course, so I went to get a bite to eat. Then I remembered that I had an assignment to do and <laughs> some other stuff. So it wasn't until about uh, 10.30 p.m. that I decided, oh, let me go back up there and see what's going on and everything. So I went by, got my lady uh, from her dorm, blah, 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 and we decided to walk up and see what was going on, right? So here we are walking up. Oh, there they are on that same corner, but it's only about 
uh, 35 to 40 of them. So I walked up, you know, I was a frat guy, so I'm checking on some of my frats here and there, whatever, et cetera. And the next thing I know, my lady snatches my arm this way, and I pull back, what's up? And she does that, and I turn this way, and about 25 uh, possum men are beginning to come ride this way with horses. Students are sitting down in the streets, and across the nation, black, historically black colleges were founded for the most part in black neighborhoods. So here, we have the college back here, and this is all a black neighborhood around here. So some black people were sitting on their porches and everything, et cetera. So when my lady snatched me this way, you know, and I looked back to see the horses coming, you know, there was nothing I could do uh, that other than get out of the way. So if any students wanted to run, which they were beginning to scramble, I wouldn't be in that way. So I saw the snatched my arm this way because I was going to jump up under this house right here. And you know, in the south, houses might sit up about this high or something like that. So I had spotted that when I spotted them, you know, and, and I don't know what I said to her, but I was gone. I was gone. So I leaped over this way, right out under the house Then I saw blacks throwing bricks and bottles, so I decided to throw a brick. So I reached back to pick up a brick to throw, and a brother was running so fast, he stepped on my hand, and I thought it was a horse. So I snatched, I dove up under the house, and, and stayed there for a couple of hours. Because, I mean, it was, you know, I wanted to see what was going on so I could report it to you guys today, right? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Next day in the newspaper, uh, black students attack uh, Possumin and refuse to allow emergency ambulance to uh, come through the street. That's what they were trying to do is clear the streets for an ambulance, right? Et cetera. I was involved in other demonstrations and pickets in the neighborhood. Uh, let's say, uh, because blacks were unable, one in Mobile in particular, blacks were unable to work in grocery stores and other convenience stores in black neighborhoods because only whites were there. Blacks couldn't even get jobs bagging groceries or whatever. So, you know, I, was, I came to Mobile, I had been away, came in, joined an organization now, neighborhood organized workers, I heard that they had helped to desegregate Mobile while I was gone and everything, so I wanted to support them. Uh, then I started hearing, as I had, would attend their Wednesday night meetings, uh, let's say with about 200, 225 people, I had started hearing that the way they desegregated Mobile, and especially downtown in Jobs, they would uh, demonstrate picket and when some blacks would cross the picket lines, uh, there might be four or five burly guys sitting around in trucks. Uh, and when they would come out, these guys would jump on them and beat them up. I said, hmm, that's the way it was? Or if women and other black women and others would go into the stores and come out, let's say, with packages, they would snatch the packages and stomp the packages and stuff like that. To, but the, the message was, stay your blank from down here, you know, et cetera. But, and they were probably so ruthless that uh, they prevailed. And uh, let's say you're going to find that uh, 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 Mobile was desegregated downtown in terms of jobs, in terms of everything. So that was that. So I hate join now. So I'm there in a Wednesday night meeting and at the same time, I was also a co-host of a radio talk show in Mobile called Today's World. And uh, I was, uh, so I was on uh, uh, broadcasting one Sunday, and uh, someone called in and wanted to know what did I think about now beating up black people, intimidating black people, snatching packages and all of that. So I said, uh, well, um, I have no uh, evidence that uh, now is responsible for anything like that because I ain't seen nothing, right? Except, but the person kept on pressing. And I, had, I was kept on trying to finesse the question until I said, I have to say something, or everybody's, the, the listeners are going to think I'm stupid as hell, right? So I saw so the person said, uh, so well, if 
now is responsible. How do you feel about that? And I had to say, well, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't uh, support anyone who would use force and intim intimidation against black people. I said, whites have done that for much too long, so I don't think blacks should use those tactics on blacks, blah, 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 blah. And that was that, until I went to uh, the Wednesday night meeting. And uh, some blacks had had their homes burned down in Mobile, who had crossed picket lines and everything, had their cars firebombed fire or something like that. So, you know, it was tough. So, and I had heard about it. I hadn't seen anything, but I had heard about it on a weekly basis. So I go to the Wednesday night meeting, and uh, so the president of now says, I have some announcements to make. I want you to know that there's a black man who has nerve enough to go on radio and talk about now and say we are guilty of this, 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 and this, et cetera. I'm not going to tell you what his name is. I'm not going to tell you uh, that, he, that he lives at 2109 Costa Rita Street. That's where my parents live, and I was staying with them, right, while I was in Mobile visiting. So uh, I'm not going to tell you that he lives there because something might happen to the house. I sure would hate for something to happen to that house, like it getting burned down, blah, blah, blah. I said, what the? My parents' house? I'm sitting in the back, so I raised my hand. I said, he said, no, bro, not now. We can, we're taking care of business because I want to remind everybody once again, uh, I'm not going to tell you his name is Melvin Ross, da 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 da. And I said, uh, excuse me, excuse me. I'm Melvin Ross. I'm Melvin Ross. Because my thinking was, I couldn't let my parents' house get burned down, right? I couldn't do that. So I said, oh, goodness, blank. Let me do this. So uh, he said, what? You, who? I said, I'm Melvin Ross. He said, on the radio? I said, yes. <laughs> he said, uh, come on up here. Come on up here. And uh, so I walked out to the aisle. And as I'm walking down the aisle, brothers were sticking their feet out like this and saying, you know, And I'm looking at there, and somebody else kicked the foot out and everything. And I'm, so I'm watching. I get up to the front. And he says, ah, oh, come on up here. You the one? You the one? You blah, 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 da, 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 da. I said, well, no, that's not what I said. He said, blank to blank to blank. You blank to blank to blank. You said blank. I said, no, that's not what I said. He said, hold on. Tape recorder. Pull the mic down. Say, listen to this, everybody. Melvin Ross. Yes, I feel I would not support any organization. Blank to blank to blank to die. He said, da 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 da, dee 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 dee, da 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 da. He said, let me play some more, da 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 da. So I, everybody was in the audience, kill that nigga. So I said, oh, blank. So I reached over, pushed the uh, tape recorder, and stopped it. And I said, okay, let me talk to you. And let me just be real with you for a minute. I said, I didn't say that you now is responsible for this, 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 and et cetera. I said, but I know you are. I even know by names who has done what. I said, but I didn't want to put that out there. I said, no, I do not want to support black people doing this, this, and this to black people. I said, because we need black support. I say, instead of 200,000 blacks at this meeting tonight, which would have been about half the population of Mobile, I said, we have about 200 or so, et cetera. And, and I, he said, uh, look at here, we have to have, we have to instill respect in, in black people. That's how the movement survives. I said, well, you aren't instilling respect, you're instilling fear, blah, 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 and blank, blank, and blank, and blank. I said, as a matter of fact, do you want me to call some names, uh, burnings, blank, blank, and blank, and blank? I said, out of every demonstration you've had for the last six weeks, I've been there. I said, and there have only, out of the two to 300 people who come to these meetings, only uh, 12 are usually there. Dogs have been turned loose on us and whatever, whatever, whatever. 
So he leaned over and whispered to his vice president. Then he came back. He said, uh, Brother Ross, I like you. And I'm wondering if you would serve as vice president for the next three weeks since Vice President Bly is leaving and he has to go, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what I want you to do, I respect you, I appreciate what you've done and how you've done it. Will you serve as a, a, a vice president? He said, what you think about that, brothers and sisters? They went. <laughs> and I went. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate this. And as a result of other commitments that I have, I won't be able to do it. I said, I'm scheduled to leave day after tomorrow. You know, da 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 And I got the blank on out of there, et cetera. And, uh, and nothing happened to my parents' house, so I was thankful for that. But at the same time, uh, I should indicate that. At the same time, I should indicate about a year and a half later, the president of now, the vice president of now, were arrested for dealing drugs, for uh, intimidating uh, uh, business officials in the city, shaking different ones down for money, all of those kinds of things, et cetera. So there's good, there's bad, and there's ugly that was involved in the movement. But that's what comes with movements because you have different people doing different things. At the same time, what was good is that blacks stuck with a movement so much so that it would broaden to include not only blacks as a civil rights movement, but also anyone, let's say, uh, based on race, color, creed, religion, gender, sexual orientation, handicapped status, on and on and on to the extent that that's been carried forward. And uh, now it's also including environmentalism. Now we also at the point of talking Black Lives Matter. And above all and beyond, we're talking about inequality. We're talking about the 99 percenters versus the uh, what, 1 percenters, et cetera. And that's perhaps is going to be even more powerful uh, in days to come and everything. But let me just stop at this point and just say, does anyone have one question before we walk out the door? Yes, sir. Okay, at what point in time are you talking? 20th century. Oh, whoa, my, oh, okay, wow. So, uh, uh, initially, in this country, uh, we've had, you know, going back to colonial days and coming up, we had a temperance movement. Uh, we had an abolitionist movement. We had a women's movement. And that takes us into the 1920s. Uh, women, of course, get the right to vote with the presidential election of 1920s, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, going one step from there, uh, as uh, we move out and get Civil Rights Act of 64, Civil Rights Bill of 65, Voting Rights for All, Civil Rights Bill of 68. So that takes in any number of movements. And by the time we get to the 70s and the 80s, movements are blowing up all across the country. Everything from, a, I mean, we're talking additional movements, everything from the gay rights movement to, uh, let's say, handicapped status, the gender movement, et cetera, and they all have picked up steam to the extent that right now uh, uh, everybody knows that whatever you have to say negative or do negative to any protected groups, you had better do it undercover. Otherwise, there will be penalties and consequences to pay. So there are so many, but I just can't get into them right now. What I will say is I think we are at a point where enough positive uh, energy is out there, whether it's for the civil rights uh, that we've talked about or for environmental rights, or you name it, you name it, you name it, and uh, the rest of the world has exploded. Next time, I'm going to want to ask you about uh, the UK. Uh, you probably have some information that I would love to get firsthand and everything. But other than that, let me thank you uh, for coming today, and I appreciate 
uh, you're listening, and let's go from there. Let's work together to what make sure we stay on this road and destination to equality and to a better uh, quality of life for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dean.